Good evening, and thank you all for being here. I have one disclosure to make. I'm actually a Palestinian, and I'm from Nablus. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't born in Palestine. I didn't grow up there. But like every Palestinian in the diaspora, we, we're not in Palestine, but Palestine is in us as we grow and, and move around the world. So yeah, as, as Judy said, I go to Palestine every year, sometimes more than once. And my work is primarily medical and educational. So I, I do medical care, I, I, I look, I'm a pediatric neurologist, so I, I do clinics, and also I, I teach. I teach medical students, I teach community pediatricians, so, and I go to Gaza as well. Actually, my last trip was just this last March. So what I'm going to talk about is the effect of apartheid on the health care of the Palestinians. Um, so basically, there are many forms of apartheid, and, and we, we all know the wall, but that's just part of it. That's probably the biggest part. But there, the crossings, there are all kinds of, of segregation. So we're going to go through them, and we're going to show you how it affects every every component of healthcare, how it affects the patients, how it affects the doctors, how it even affects the medical students who are trying to be trained and be doctors. So uh, basically it controls, we start with the patients, so it does control patients' mobility. As you know, Palestinians are not allowed to go even within, within like they're sometimes within the Palestinian cities, like uh, from Nablus to Hebron, let's say, sometimes they're not even allowed to make that trip, let alone going to Jerusalem. They need, people in the West Bank have to have permits to be in East Jerusalem or even to go to pray in the Dome of the Rock, or to go to the, to the churches in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem. So definitely patients have very limited mobility to access health care. Um, and that basically they, 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 oh, and the Gaza Strip, which we all know is under siege now since 2006, these, the, 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 Gaza, the people in Gaza have no access whatsoever to help to Palestinian hospitals outside Gaza, or any hospitals for that fact, except the ones in Gaza. Um, and, if, and then, as I said, patients within the West Bank, they require permits to travel between the regions for medical treatment, and they have to cross all kinds of barriers. So this is the first barrier they have to go over. So this is, we know, it's about 800, more than 800 kilometers long. It's, it's longer than Berlin Wall. It's higher than the Berlin Wall. So it's about eight meters high. And basically, this wall stands between one third of the villages in the West Bank and healthcare. So for these villages to get to the nearest hospital, this wall prevents them. And in the, and, and, and some areas, there are gates that are, like in, in the village of Qalqilia, for instance, the gate opens in a certain time of the day. So if they can make it in these times in and out, they're either trapped in or trapped out. So and there's no hospital in Calpheria. So you can imagine how difficult to get to the nearest hospital, which is the main tertiary hospital for the Palestinians, really, is El Maqasid Hospital, which is in East Jerusalem. And for anyone in the West Bank to get to El Maqasid Hospital, they need a permit. And one thirty thousand children also, they are deprived of basic pediatric care. We're not talking about fancy stuff. We're talking about immunization. We're talking about well baby visits. We are talking about the very basic pediatric care that any well child needs. They, they have difficulty getting to the clinics or the hospitals if they can go through the gates of this wall. Checkpoint. So, okay, we passed the wall. Now we have to go through checkpoints. This is the famous checkpoint of Qalqilia. Um, sorry, Qalandia. Qalandia checkpoint. Here, this is the main shock point that separates the West Bank to East Jerusalem. So basically, the Palestinians, if they, get, if they have a permit to get to East Jerusalem, so, okay, we got the permit, and imagine a sick person or an elderly who has to travel. The, the cars in the West Bank, which they have a, like a Palestinian plate, they can't actually be in, the, in, in East Jerusalem. So what happens is that they take a car that gets them to the checkpoint, they have to walk, get to the other side of the checkpoint, get another car that gets them to East Jerusalem. 
So we passed the permit issue, now we have a permit, but now get the elderly or a sick person to make the journey to East Jerusalem by in, in this way. So people actually have to walk to get to the, to the other side to get the car and get to East Jerusalem. This is the barrier that separates Hebron. So, as you know, some of you, Hebron is two parts, H1 and H2, okay? So the H1 region is where more than about 175,000 Palestinians live, or, or even more, and they're mainly Palestinians, um, the, the area. Then you have the H2, where there's about 50,000 Palestinians live, alongside with around 500, 500 settlers. And this is the barrier where actually at this side of the barrier, Palestinians are not allowed to drive cars. So if they live here, this is, this is H1, where the Palestinian area where I'm standing, taking the picture, and this is H2. So the Palestinian has to leave a vehicle, whatever, and they have to walk to their homes because no Palestinian cars are, are allowed behind that barrier. Again, imagine a sick person trying to get to hospital if they live behind that barrier. And let alone the lives that the Palestinians have alongside with these 500 uh, settlers, uh, you probably aware about the abuse, about all the um, uh, attacks that the, 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 as, the, as the kids go to school, they're attacked by the settler. The YouTube is just full of that. So I'm not gonna like, uh, uh, and, and, and it's, it's very uh, well known. And, and, the, and I will show you other pictures where the home of the Palestinians actually are, have iron bars to protect them from the settlers attacking their home. And no home should be left empty because you can, they can come home and they, they found family and settlers in their home and good luck getting them out. So they don't leave their homes empty. Someone has to be there all the time to protect the house. This is another barrier, so now we are in Gaza, and this is as, as you getting out of Ares crossing. So you've finished all the searches and all the documents, and, and you've you gone through Ares crossing, which is, a, which is the huge crossing. It's, it's almost like, it's, it's, I, 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 I always worry about taking pictures because the soldiers, if they see me, it's, it's a problem. So I take them in, in this very discreetly, and this is one of the ones I managed to take. So here, as you leave Ares, and you're done with all your, pay, you know, now you have to walk through about, it's about two kilometers. This fenced corridor is about two kilometers long, and at the end of it, this is when you actually finish that corridor, you're in Gaza now. And now you have their taxis and cars that can take you to the, to the Palestinian uh, crossing. So again, when I was there, like I see the, uh, the elderly, because uh, Gaza only sometimes they allow very sick people to leave Gaza for medical treatment. People with cancer, people who need like really severe needs. So they are very sick people. So they have to walk. So what they got, they got golf carts for some of them. So they put them on golf carts, and I was alone, so they're, they're every, the activity was, was very, very um, quiet here when I was crossing. Because I was crossing during this, this picture, I took this picture when I went there during the 2014 aggression. So not many people were going out in, in Gaza. So this is why it looks very empty. But if there are people, you will see golf carts with elderly on it trying to get through this two kilometers long corridor um, uh, to get out or get in of, of Gaza. So about 200,000 Palestinians apply for permits each year to get to East Jerusalem to get medical care. Many of them get declined. Patients in Gaza have to be questioned by the Shin Beit. So this is very interesting. Only the people in Gaza, if you're a sick person and you need to go out, Shin Beit has to question you before they give you the permit. And if you are a little bit not too, too old, they will ask you to be an informer before they give you the permit. So it's, 
it's really like oh, they negotiate. So you're you need the treatment, you need to get out. But okay, what is your neighbors doing? What is happening with your? We we just want to know. So they make it like you're, you. They want you to tell a story, but in fact, they want you to inform them about your next door neighbor, what they're doing, and 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 then you can actually they can contact you for more information. So they bargain. They really bargain to, to, to with these uh, desperately people, desperate people who need to get out to, to save their lives or to, 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 to get better. And this is the point of being questioned by the Shin Beit for, for people in Gaza. Shin Beit is the Israeli um, CIA, if you like. Or, yeah, yes. Yes, the... the hmm? Or Gestapo. Oh, the Gestapo, yes. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Okay, so the medical professionals. Now we, we move to the doctors. How is their mobility? How can they go to, the, to work? How can they reach their clinics with all, with all these barriers? So, six Palestinian hospitals are in East Jerusalem. And the Makassid is the main tertiary hospital. There is another main one, which is called uh, Augusta Victoria, which is mainly for, uh, for uh, uh, cancer patients. And there are other four more. So these Palestinian hospitals are populated by Palestinian doctors. Not all of them live in East Jerusalem to reach these hospitals, actually, because there is a very limited number of how many doctors can actually cross from the West Bank to East Jerusalem to reach their workplace. So they only allow 200 employees from the West Bank are allowed to work in East Jerusalem. So if a, if a doctor is working in one of these hospitals in East Jerusalem, if they need more than more people, they can. There's this quota of 200. So unless someone dies, hmm? 2,000 employees, sorry, I'm saying 200, 2,000. So if someone dies or drops or retired, or then you can get a substitute. Before that, no way, even if there's a need, even if there's a specialty that's missing, if it's 2,000, that's it. That's the number allowed to, for people to work in East Jerusalem to populate these hospitals. And the, the doctors also need permits to get to there. So it's not like, like any other, other citizen. So they need the, uh, uh, permits to be in East Jerusalem. And their permits are renewed every three to six months. So if you're a doctor, Palestinian doctor, living in the West Bank, working in one of the hospitals in East Jerusalem, you never know when your permit is going to be revoked. You may, have, you may have a job or you not have a job in three months or to six months. Okay, I'm actually, I, I took this journey with them. Having a Canadian passport, I don't have to. I can go and, and, have, and have actually a, a taxi with an Israeli plate. I can go through the checkpoint, no issues. But I wanted to make this and, and meet with them in Al Maqasid Hospital. But I wanted to be with, with my colleagues, with my friends, the, the other Palestinian doctors who want to reach Al Maqasid Hospital because on that day I had clinic there and I was supposed to teach. So this is where they start their day. They have a meeting point in Ramallah. So doctors from different parts, they meet at this meeting point. There's a bus. So they go on the bus. They all have their permits. And, and, and they have to be really early, because if they want to be in the hospital for 8 o'clock, they have to start this journey about 6 o'clock. OK? So then they go, and here we go on the bus, approaching the checkpoint of uh, Kalandia. And then the bus stops here, and the soldiers come on the bus, and they check the paperwork of each of the doctors. They see them every day. <laughs> Sometimes it's the same soldiers, right? Yet they check their, they are, they are more or less the same doctors, and they check their paperwork, and, and, and sometimes they search them if it's, a, if it's another young new soldier who 
really have nothing to do for the rest of the day, decide to search a doctor, so they ask them to come down and they do some quick body search, they go back on the bus and they, they off they, so this is their journey to work. Imagine them arriving to work after all of this and having to see tens of patients for that day. And here we go, we've arrived. Uh, we arrived to Al-Maqasid Hospital. This is the library where, we, where they all meet with their students to give the morning report. Just like a Canadian hospital that I was trained in. In the morning, we all may meet at 8 o'clock to go over the patients from the night before and hand it over to the daytime people. This is exactly the same routine. So they have to be there at 8 o'clock to hear about the night before and start their day. So this is where we meet, and, and then if there's a lecture or if there's a seminar that takes place, it takes place in the library. This is uh, one of my colleagues there. He's a pediatric neurologist as well, Dr. Khalil. Um, the students. So, so just before we leave the doctors, just, it, it is really like to go through all of this and, and then yet, Arrive to your workplace with a smile, be ready to see your patients and deliver care. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm amazed like how they do it day after day and, and yet they have to go through this every single day to get to work. The good news is that when I was there just past March, they told me that they're considering allowing them to go through their car, with their cars. So maybe the bus step is going to be is, is they're going to omit the bus, so hopefully it happens. So the medical students, and so these are Palestinian medical students, uh, girls and boys, actually in medical schools sometimes the girls are more than the boys, um, and here they're meeting for one of their classes. Um, basically there are four medical schools in Palestine, two in the West Bank, Al-Quds University in Abu Dis, which is a, a little village just outside uh, East Jerusalem, and Al Najah University in Nablus, and there are two in Gaza, the Islamic University and Al Azhar University. So four medical schools. The interesting part, of course, that now you have this medical school which is just outside East Jerusalem. So the Israelis doesn't allow students from the West Bank to go and study in this university unless they have a permit. And so you get your acceptance in medical school, which you probably, this is your dream, and you've worked so hard to get to medical school, and you may not get the permit just to be in the school because you live in a West Bank city out that's not in Jerusalem, because you live in Nablus, or you live in Hebron, or you live in Jenin. And, and you don't get the permit from the Israelis to be in, in, in Abu Dis, you can't go to medical school. And basically 10% of these students get denied permits. There's, so if you don't get to Abu Dis, which is next to East Jerusalem, the only chance is a Najah University in Nablus, and this is relatively new. Actually, they've built it because of this problem, so that at least the, the people who in the West Bank who cannot make it to, to because Al-Quds University is older, the medical school there has been there for some time, but they noticed the students can't get to it, and they had to have a solution, so they opened another one in the West Bank. And this brings me to the question of resources here. Because of the restriction in mobility, Palestinians have to be very creative in making things available for their kids and for the students to have access to with all these barriers which makes it a huge impact and drain on the limited the resources that are already limited. So instead of having a school, a central school that can you know, accommodate everybody and will be economically efficient and, and makes more sense, they have to make all these satellite schools in different places, spend money on these satellite schools and have faculty for all these satellite schools so that students have access to them because if they have a centralized university, the accessibility to this university would be a huge problem and will deprive a lot of students from becoming doctors, which are desperately needed there. So students need permits, limited number to study in Israeli schools, restrictions to attend meetings around the world. That's also another problem. Like, so I can't tell you how many times 
like if there's a conference, especially in my field, when I, there are two, three pediatric neurologists I know in Palestine, and there are meetings that I go to, they're supposed to go to as part of you know, building their, their knowledge and, and keeping it up to date. And I want to ask, are you coming, guys? No, depending on the permit. No, if we're allowed to leave. It's unbelievable, like really, even attending meetings and going back. So medical trainees don't leave Gaza. So, so you have two medical schools in Gaza. And I've met a couple of students who actually managed somehow to leave Gaza and, re and get to Al-Quds University in East Jerusalem. And they will not go back for until their medical degree is over. We're talking about five to six years. Because if they go back to Gaza, they may not be able to go out again. And they stay in hiding. Like they avoid checkpoints, they avoid going far from the university campus. Just because if they get caught, they'll be in prison. That's for sure. So there are medical schools in Gaza. And I, was, I just visited one when I was there in March and gave a talk about, about the rehabilitation for kids with, uh, with stroke. And I was amazed by the level, by the training that these kids get. There is, I don't know how they pull their resources. It's just, it's just astonishing. The, the interaction I had with the students, the kind of questions they asked me, I didn't feel that I, I was away from my Canadian students. So it's, it was really, I mean, sometimes going to Gaza actually is a lifting experience as, uh, when you see how resilient they are. Okay, emergency services, which is, it's a huge problem. Restricted movement of ambulances between the West Bank and, and East Jerusalem. This is again, West Bank and East Jerusalem is, is a huge problem. So what they, so they, if the ambulance is allowed to go, to, to re, they want to reach Al Maqasid, they want to reach the main tertiary hospital that has actually emergency services. So the ambulance is searched, the patient sometimes have, has to, to go out of the ambulance so that the soldiers can get everything out of the ambulance. So they, they search them, they search the patients, they search their families, they even, I've seen them, I couldn't take the picture, unfortunately the soldiers were there, this back in 2002 when I was there, they, this, like everything in the ambulance was out, literally. And it took two hours when, until they finished searching. So if you have a critical care done dead, like by then, if you need to get to a hospital. So I'm just really, These, these pictures are taken in this, like really in hiding. Like we, we, you, 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 can't, they can't, you can't let them see you taking these pictures. Okay, back-to-back -back procedure. When I heard this, I said, what, the, what is that? What is back-to-back -back procedure? And they explained it to me, in my, the ambulance uh, drivers. So they reach to the check. This is just outside, like Janine. They reach to the checkpoint. So the ambulance is not allowed to go beyond the checkpoint. So what they do, they carry the patient, okay? The family with the driver, with the, they carry the patient to another ambulance on the other side of the checkpoint. And they put that patient on that ambulance waiting and they take, it, take that patient to the hospital. That is back-to-back -back procedure. Okay, health, do I have still a bit of time? Yeah. Health of the Palestinians, whose responsibility it is. Palestinian Authority. So now, with the disaster of Oslo, and please allow me to say that, because I think it's a disaster, and I, in my mind, it is our third Nakbe, our third catastrophe as Palestinians. So um, the Palestinian Authority, after Oslo, they were given the civil sort of control over the West Bank. So now, they say, okay, the Palestinian Authority has to be responsible for the health of the Palestinians. Okay, fine. Where the money is coming from? Who's, who controls the money? Israel. So Israel has all the taxes, all the donations. Anything that comes to the health, to the Palestinian Authority goes through Israel first. So anytime, and, and, and you hear it in the news, oh, they held the taxes, and when something happens, they hold the taxes. What that means, the Palestinian Authority has no money. So 
Last year when I was in Al-Maqasid, I was talking to the doctors and they were talking among themselves, where are we going to get salaries? And I said, what do you mean? He said, we haven't got salaries for the past six months. They weren't paid because the part of their salary to Al-Maqasid comes from the Palestinian Authority. These doctors, if they don't have some private practice, they can't even feed their kids. So they haven't got money or salaries for six months. It was, to me, it was like unbelievable. And because, frankly, the Palestinian Authority doesn't have money to give them. This is why. Or they're corrupt and they steal the money. That's another thing. But that's another talk. <laughs> okay. So Israel as an occupying force, they say, okay, we, we were not in the West Bank. We, you have now, you have the civil, you have to take care of the population. We, we're, not, we're not occupying the West Bank. What are your soldiers doing there every day? They go in and out as they please. They arrest people as they please. They're there every day. So what do you mean you're not an occupying, uh, occupying force? So now you have a Palestinian population where their health care, no one is claiming responsibility for it. So a crippled healthcare system in Palestine. And there's evidence why it's a crippled healthcare system. You look, the, look at the statistics. Lower average life expectancy by at least 10 years compared to the rest of the world. Higher rate of infection diseases. Higher infant mortality. The rest of the world, you have only less than four infants die every thousand births. In Palestine, there are almost 20 infants die. Look at the, at the ratio. Higher maternal death, 28 versus 7 in the rest of the world compared to for each 100,000. Fewer medical professions. So for every 1,000 residents, you have less than one doctor in Palestine, while in the world you have almost two doctors for the rest. Of, and, and this is like comparing globally with all the socioeconomic status of many countries. This is terrible. So two different populations governed by Israel using two different sets of rule and privileges. Compare that to the Israeli citizen. I won't even make the comparison. You probably know it very well. What their privileges, what they get, the, what, what kind of health care they get. So this is my last slide, just to show you apartheid is in every aspect of Palestinian life. It's not just in health. So this is, again, this is Hebron. This is the market. So this is when they divide Hebron with the settlers. The settlers kept harassing all these shops and all these and, until they had to close them. If you go to the, like the, the central market in Hebron used to be so lively, full of people. Half of it, if not more, are closed shops now because of the constant harassment of the 500 settlers that are living there close to these shops. See how, how this is the market, not many shops there. This is, used to be the main market in Hebron. You see this tent here of wires on top? I walked in this, in this market. And the settlers live just above here, right, in these windows. They had to put this tent because the settlers would throw stones and garbage and you name it on and dirty water on the people in the market. So they had to do this at least, at least it won't prevent fluids, but it will prevent rocks and, and you could see stuff on top there. This is, this is getting into the Ibrahim Mosque. So it's separated. The half of it is allowed for only for Jews and the other half only for Palestinians. So for a Palestinian to get to the mosque to pray has to go through, has to be searched and has to go through all these electrical doors and barriers just to get to the prayer place. So barriers in their health, barriers in their economy, barriers in their schools, barriers even in their religion and their access to their religious places. However, I want to finish with a positive note. 
it, as Nelson Mandela said, it's always impossible until it's done, right? So this is what is left of the Berlin Wall. I was in Berlin last yeah. summer, and this is what is left of the Berlin Wall. This is what is left, one simple gate and a little bit of, of stones from a wall that's surrounding Havana as well. So this is what's left of it. It's all got destroyed. So definitely our wall will come down too. It's just a matter of time. With the resilience of these people, it's going to come down. Thank you.